our meeting Tuesday, June 12th. Um, calling our meeting to order. Um, all commissioners are here present, so we have a full quorum this evening. Everyone ready? Okay. Um, approval of our minutes from last month. Has anyone had a chance to look over them? Are there any questions or discussion that we need to have? Motion to approve. Second. I, I just okay. Second. Second. <laughs> All right, last month's minutes are approved. <clears throat> so our first order of business is um, we have a presentation from the Hastings Football Club, HFC United. Yes, uh, we've got Sean and other representatives from the Hastings Football Club here tonight. They're going to give us a presentation and help educate us all about uh, youth soccer here in Hastings. Um, Sean, I'm going to hold you off for like one second. And we've got a, a guest with us tonight I'd like for you guys to uh, be introduced to. So with that. Hi there, I'm Anna Helgett. I'm the Summer um, Parks and Recreation intern. I'm going to the University of Wisconsin La Crosse and I'm originally from Hastings. So she'll be um, helping out Paige a ton with programming pieces and uh, all the other stuff that, that Paige is responsible for. So you will see her around at events. You'll see her out and about in the community. So uh, we're very happy to have her. It is fabulous when we have uh, some interns for the summertime, and we're happy to have you, Anna. Awesome. With that, Sean. Thank you. Um, I don't know, do you have a screen in front of you, or are you going to just this or listen to me? Um, I'm Sean Qualley. I'm the field coordinator with HFC Hastings Football Club United. Um, with me is uh, our president, Jeremy Reuter, and we have Seal Strauss. She kind of handles everything in the past, and now she just handles our indoor recreational stuff. Um, so just kind of go over what we have here. It'll be short and sweet for you. Our mission statement is we're a nonprofit committed to providing a quality soccer program in Hastings and surrounding community. Focus is to develop each member, whether they're a player, coach, referee, or manager, parent to the fullest pot potential at all levels of participation. We are a nonprofit, 501c3. We began in 2009. If we have any questions about anything before 2009, SEAL would be the one for that, because she was part of HYAA, which is what Hastings Soccer was back then. Um, and then she transitioned it with the board back then over to HFC United. Um, so we were part of HYAA back then. Um, currently, we operate a recreational program for youth ages 4 to 11, an indoor recreational program, grades 5 through 12, and a traveling program in association with Minnesota Youth Soccer Association, MYSA. And that's pretty much ages 8 through 18, and that's the competitive portion of soccer. Uh, the recreational is more of the fun, get out, kind of learn the stuff. The travel program is the competitive. You go around the metro area, around the state, even if needed, around the nation to, to compete and play soccer. Uh, our board, our, our actual board voting members, we got Jeremy is here. We have a vice president, secretary, treasurer, um, travel, traveling director, director of recreational soccer, director of communications and marketing, director of coaching and development for a boy side, that's Howard, <coughs> and director of coaching and development for a girl side, that's Brady. Those are our only two paid positions in the entire club, <coughs> and they're paid on a contract basis, which is a two year contract. And then we have multiple coordinators. So the board members themselves, the top half, all have voting rights on our board. The coordinators, we just coordinate basically what our titles are. Like in my case, the field coordinator, I meet often with uh, Chris and Phil and uh, to do park stuff, to get our field ready in the, in the, in the spring. I'll usually meet with them, um, get our initial line painting down, and then you guys as parks graciously take over the line painting after that, and we love that. Um, we have equipment coordinators, volunteer coordinator, tournament activities coordinator. We haven't had a tournament in a few years. We do want to try and bring that back. So hopefully that would happen in the near future. Um, outdoor, indoor recreational coordinator. We wanted to keep Seal around because she's been around for so long. So we created that spot a few years ago for her when she tried to leave us. And uh, she still does a great job with the indoor stuff for us when we use the arena for that. Um, a website team coordinator and we do have three open spots currently. Basically our coordinators do all the heavy <coughs> thing, right? We, the board does a lot of the decision making and they take care of all the, the minutia and details and we really appreciate that. So. And that 
ended up in the wrong spot there, but well, that'll come up in a second. Indoor recreational soccer. So we're talking about indoor rec. We play in the Civic Arena once the ice is pulled out, which uh, the city typically pulls it out right around spring break time um, and throws the, uh, the carpet down for us or the indoor turf. Um, and we do an indoor recreational program. <coughs> Usually it's a couple practice sessions and then we go right into a, a league or a round robin tournament play. Um, one group of middle school, fifth through eighth graders and a group of high school, nine through 12. The teams are divided up based on those middle school or high school. Um, CEO does a great job of letting the kids kind of run that program in theory of the kids are basically the coaches, the kids are the team managers. We do have, an, for the middle school, we do have a parent that oversees them, but the kids are the ones that are creating these teams. They're doing a draft like you would in a football draft of any kind or a baseball draft or a hockey draft. We let the kids pick their teams. Um, there are some special limitations because we don't want to have, at the high school level, we don't want to have all level nine highest level played players on one team playing a bunch of level one players. So there are some checks and balances there that we've created over the years. For our indoor rec program, we've had 104 back in 2013 and this is just going to show you that it's pretty much gone up every year since. Um, so this last year we had 10 high school teams, eight middle school teams, and we maxed out before the deadline to register even, and we have the last couple of years. I think we added, we obviously added some this year. We went from 160 to 175 to add a couple of those teams in there. Um, outdoor recreational play. And that's for our youngest group. <coughs> we coordinate the youth program for soccer, ages four, pre-K through age 11, roughly at the oldest, sixth grade. Um, usually by that age, though, they're kind of moving over to travel if they want to stay in soccer anyway. Players have practice sessions and play in games. Typically the young, younger ages are geared toward learning the game of soccer and focus on playing as a team. Seasons are broken into two seasons and that's the same with travel as well. Um, spring and fall. Spring runs May through July. Fall runs August through October. Um, I feel like I'm missing something there on outdoor. We all, <laughs> here's, that's what I wanted. We do utilize the, uh, three of the city parks. Um, I've worked with uh, Chris and Phil to basically coordinate my goal when I became the field coordinator about two and a half years ago. I took it over from Seal because she wanted to step down from some stuff, was I wanted to focus on getting our parks that we were able to use um, kind of a dedicated space for that age group because we kind of had age groups throughout different parks. Like one park may have two different age groups, whereas another one might have just only one. So kind of what we've done is Tuttle Park, we've got four small fields. And we utilize that with four to six year olds. The coaches bring out what we call pop-up goals. They're about four foot wide by about three foot tall. They can throw them in the trunk of their car. That's what they use for goals. Those are the youngest age kids. Keeping them from chasing butterflies and kicking a ball around is what our goal is. So, um, Lions Park, we utilize Lions Park. This year we were able to get it up to four actually painted fields. I do have a fifth set of goals out there though. We have, a, they're called medium sized fields for the six to eight year olds. We do have goals for the, that field that HFC bought and paid for last year, and we moved those out to that park. And then Wallen Park. Wallen, we have two what we call U8 size fields, and they utilize a U9 size goal, which is the smallest traveling style goal, traveling as in age-wise. Um, and we bought two brand new goals for that. I don't even know, have you seen them out there yet? We put them out there two weeks ago, <laughs> about two, three weeks ago. Two, two sets of brand new goals that we moved out there for that. Work with, yeah, we work with uh, Corey and, and Phil to make sure we get those moved around for mowing and for painting and stuff like that. Usually Phil's pretty good about emailing me a couple of days ahead of time and I blast an email out to a bunch of parents and say, hey, somebody go move it so we can get that stuff moved around. Our numbers from Outdoor Rec, again, you can kind of see that they've gone up. That 2018 number is spring only. That's why it's so low there. Um, so you can see that the numbers have pretty much They've, they've stayed the same. There was a big change. I don't know, Seal, do you know why there's that big change from 2013? That's, yeah, fifth and sixth grade, because we forced them over to basically travel at that point if they wanted to continue playing. Um, so I suspect that 470-ish number will probably be about the same number once we get fall recreational going here at the end of the summer here. Is it a little bit more in the spring? Yes. yes. Uh, we tend to have a little bit of transfer over to with like football in the fall and a couple other sports that kids are dividing their time between. There's just more time in that spring summer season for kids to either pick one or sometimes they'll do both kind of depending on what 
what they have time for. Yeah, we're, we're competing right now with uh, basically baseball and lacrosse for summertime. Whereas in the fall, it's uh, um, football, and that's a big that's a big push for some of our kids. You know, the boys at least go for that football. So, and do you think with the MN UFC or the MN United um, uh, soccer team, there, there may be an increase in soccer we hope. interest? That'd we be hope. The, that'd be the with, hope, you know, right? The, the stadium <laughs> being built and all that. Yeah, yeah, you'd hope so, right? You know, there's going to be more interest in general. Wherever you look around, they always say soccer is the world sport because it's played it everywhere in the world yep. um, so that we, we hope there is okay. cool. outdoor travel is comp competitive play that's where we uh, coordinate with MYSA Minnesota Youth Soccer which promotes youth soccer in Minnesota in a fair safe and enjoyable format for all skill levels MYSA is a member of US Youth so Soccer in the United States Soccer Association um, and that's where we get some of our uh, insurance that we cover through them and just different stuff and they're the ones that create all of our um, Bracketing. A bracketing for our, our travel play and scheduling and stuff like that. Um, we utilize for our, our travel program, we utilize Veterans Athletic Complex. Um, I'm able to get it to a nine fields out there, youth U9 through U18. Um, we typically we have four U9, U10 fields. This is how they're broken up is by age. Um, three U11, U12 fields and two what we call full size fields, which would be FIFA. Those are at a minimum FIFA standards, which is federal <coughs> soccer, um, U13 and plus. So one is obviously the lighted field out at Vets, and then the other one usually is just a little bit smaller, but I make sure it's always within FIFA standards. MYSA will come out and measure fields if there's ever a, c a concern. All those fields have to be a certain size in order to be part of MYSA and be a competitive field. So we've always maintained those sizes. We have two seasons with that as well. Again, it runs May through July and September through October. Our age groups used to run school year up until last year. Um, now it's the age groups are run by birth year. So a 2003 birth year child is considered a U15 player. Uh, we utilize 25 youth referees right now in Hastings and three adult referees from Hastings for our travel games. Part of MYSA is you have to have officials um, they, it's an official game. It's actually a tournament setup. It's bracketed. It's statewide. Um, if a team wins here, they may end up, when it comes down to state tournament wise, they may end up traveling to Duluth for the final game of that tournament in effect. Um, all of our officials are paid. Yep, they're all paid. We use a, a company called Refa Assigners to schedule all of our officials. So that 25 youth referees are just our Hastings kids that are refereeing games for us but they're getting paid to do that. And we have three adults that are typically coming, but we do pull from Red Wing, we pull from a couple Cannon, we pull from Cottage Girl, we pull from Woodbury when we need others. Um, it's just whatever the assigner group has, but those are our numbers for our kids here. Uh, these are our numbers we've had since 2013, so you got spring and fall. <coughs> Sorry. Again, usually fall, fewer teams in the fall, uh, again, which is competing sports and school and different things that get that going. And the biggest thing in the fall too is, is that the older mm. age groups cannot compete in the right. MYSA program because of high school league rules. So that's another way that the numbers fall down in the fall. So 26 teams in the spring, one team went to state in 2013. We had 369 players just in the travel program. 2014, 2015, we went up to 347, so we were down a little bit, and again, that kind of comes to some changes. 2016, we went to 387 players in the spring and 208 in the fall. Last year, 333 players. Four teams went to the state tournament in the summertime. And now 2018, we have 25 teams currently, 335 players roughly. And we would suspect that those numbers for the fall would stay about the same as they have the last couple of years. <coughs> Although we're primarily made up of Hastings youth, we have been able to reach out to other players. Um, this year, we were able we were able to talk about the other day, we were trying to figure it out. Three years ago, we had nobody but Hastings youth that we knew of. Um, the team that my son played on, we were looking for a couple of players. We graciously had a couple kids that somehow found out about our indoor program from Cannon Falls. We put them on teams in, out of Cannon Falls up here to play on the indoor program in the arena. Um, I looked at those kids and I said, how old are they? 
and can they come play in the summertime <laughs> with us? Because they were that good. Um, we got them both. We got both those boys that year for the team that my son was on, which was great. Um, ever since then, those two players have been bringing more and more kids from Cannon Falls. We now have 18 players from Cannon Falls and three from Randolph that they know. Cannon Falls does not have a youth soccer program that's competitive. They just started kind of a recreational program, I think a year and a half ago, um, based on some of the stuff that they've seen with us up here. Uh, the coordinator schedules all the competitive, so this is kind of what I have to do, outside of from getting fields ready, is I schedule all the games out at VETS, summer and fall, once the schedules are given to me from MYSA. <coughs> so here's our summer schedules. Here's what we had for games. 2015, we had 142. 51 in the fall that, I, that we ended up scheduling. 143 and 72. 126 and 46. And this year we had 125 games, and I suspect again in the fall probably about the same. Uh, recreational coordinator schedules all the games for recreational because they schedule less games. Um, some of those rec games we do allow referees to when we use our youngest referees. They do get paid to go ref those games as well then. We're utilizing volunteers for all of our positions as well as many of the coaches. Many, many, many of our coaches, I don't, Jeremy might have the number, are volunteer parents. Most, yeah. Um, and kind of like I have up there, if a coach is paid, the payment is made by the parents of the player. HSC is not paying them at all. Um, HSC utilizes the two director of coaching player development positions. And we do have some times where we have like a contract of coaches that come in for specialized training. Um, a good example on that is goalie. We utilize Shane Lanning. I'm sure a lot of people from town know who Shane is. Um, he's from town for many years. And his wife as well, Crystal, for paid coaching for goalie type stuff. So they'll come in, they'll do a couple sessions, and the board will negotiate a fee for them. And then usually we don't charge, well, usually we don't charge that fee back on to our members. So basically if they're running a, a coaching or a goalie session, we tell all of our kids that want to be goalies, hey, they're doing a goalie session on these dates, go over there and learn how to, learn how to be a goalie. <clears throat> we offer an indoor spring break camp to all members of the club that's held in the Civic Arena during, during spring break each year. <coughs> we offer a summer camp, a prep for travel camp for recreational players to see if they want to move from recreational to, to try out uh, traveling. A pre-tryout camp, those are typically for kids who have uh, not really done a tryout session before. And then we do tryouts for traveling to make sure we have our best level seeded players to have our highest seeds. Um, in MYSA, you have a C3, which is kind of your lowest level of travel place, C2, C1, and you can go Premier, Premier 2. And we've never had any Premier teams. We've always just kept it at, pretty much all of ours have been C2 or C3. Um, MYSA delegates you. You can, you can self-select up to a certain year, and then once you get to that year where you can no longer self-select, your delegation of your, your competitive level, the C level, C1, 2, or 3, is based on your record from the previous season. And we do utilize recre uh, four recreational academies for rec players. That's during the summer. So we get all of our rec kids together. Instead of having a game out at Lions or a game out at Wallen, we bring them all to vets. And they do real fun games, competitive games against each other and against coaches and parents and stuff like that. In the past, we've hosted the MYSA U9, U10 Summer Jamboree. Um, Seal, do you know how many years we hosted that? Basically, that brings in U9, U10 players from throughout the entire state of Minnesota. They came here to Hastings and they played in a, in a jamboree, not a tournament, but a jamboree, a fun, a fun event, basically. Um, we did also host the River City Rumble, which was our HFC tournament. Um, and then we stopped that about four years ago, three or four years ago. And we are looking, and it, the reason we stopped it basically is we were competing with too many other tournaments. During the summer months from late April until now, probably next week or the week after, yep. mid-June, there's a tournament somewhere in the metro area every weekend. Often multiple, I'd say. Yeah, multiple. Yep. This weekend there's probably four or five tournaments. So it's, it's hard to compete. So we had, uh, had to think outside the box and we think we have a couple ideas on how to bring a tournament back to Hastings. 
um, stuff that's not really done up here in Minnesota that some of our teams have gone on to Iowa and, and participated in. So that's something that we're, we're looking at. Hosting a tournament is a huge endeavor, endeavor and it takes a lot of work on volunteers. So that's what we're gonna look at, working on that. Um, <coughs> so we currently use the city parks, like I mentioned, Vets Athletic, Hastings Civic Arena. We use that March through May. So once the ice is pulled out, and then usually uh, Chris is good about letting us get out on the fields once the fields are nice. So hopefully we try to get out there mid-April, early May. Um, this year was a little different with the 10 feet of snow we got, but we may do. I was actually a little worried our games this year were supposed to start May 1st, and we got that last snowstorm, like what, April 25th or so? I was scrambling to get fields painted initially and working with Chris and uh, Bill to make sure we had everything going. <coughs> we utilize Hastings Public Schools, the gym space, December through May. And about uh, two years ago now, uh, Dundas Dome. Dundas Dome is a privately funded, privately owned dome down in Northfield, Dundas. Um, it's owned by three families that decided a few years ago to build a dome. Um, we utilize that in November through May for practice and training. In 2018, we've paid for Hastings Civic Arena use right around $15,000. That was for our rec program and for our training facility use there. Um, so that's paid here to the city. And we have no problem doing that. We, don't, we, we love keeping things here in the city. We've, uh, we've paid out about $1,000 this year for public school gym space. That's down a little bit over the last couple years. And that's mostly because gym space is lacking now. Other sports are getting in there and it's just not efficient for us. It's too soft or too fast of a play field. A, a gym floor is not the greatest floor to play on. Um, the biggest thing though, we've paid over $20,000 to Dundas Dome this year alone. And we would rather keep that money here in Hastings if we can. Uh, kind of like I said, significantly dropped for that school space for the last three years. Dundas Dome opened for operation, so that was an option for us at that time, although we realized that we're paying more and we're driving further to get down there. The type of surface was much better for our conductive play and practice. <coughs> uh, Dundas was open in fall of 2016. It was one of the first, we were one of the first area soccer clubs to approach them besides Northfield to say, hey, you got this great facility. Can we get in here somehow and use it? Um, and they were gracious enough and we worked out contracts with them to get down there and use that. Um, uh, kind of a side note, all the goals for soccer within the city of Hastings are bought and paid for with HFC funds or MYSA grants. Um, we have more than enough goals right now. And all the goals, which when you go to some soccer clubs, you see their netting is falling apart, balls gone. fall through the <laughs> side or it's gone completely. Um, one of the things I've worked on over the last couple of years is making sure that we have good equipment and working equipment. I've been able to get all of our netting completely turned over so we have all new netting for all of our goals. So they're good quality goals and they're good quality netting right now. <coughs> Just about done here for you guys. Partnerships and goals for us. Uh, we enjoy working with the city, Bill, Corey, and Chris, um, and the Parks Department in general. Our goal is to make youth soccer more enjoyable for our area youth. And we wouldn't mind pulling in more Cannon Falls kids. Um, maybe we'll pull down a couple Cottage Grove kids. Um, we call Afton kids Hastings kids because most of them go to Hastings anyway. Um, Red Wing has their own big program, so we're obviously not pulling from Red Wing. Um, that's the same with Cottage Grove. They've got a huge soccer program. That's why we're not pulling from them, them as much. We would welcome the opportunity in the future to assist planning of any of the city parks or athletic complex or any kind of expansion. Um, just kind of brainstorming, I've had the opportunity to go around with my son in the level of play that he has and see a lot of different fields and a lot of different complexes. Um, it'd be nice to have more grass field space. Just in general, not only for us as soccer, but for lacrosse, for football, for any sport that plays on grass and grass as a grass field. That'd be great. Um, expansion of Vets Athletic Complex would be nice. Um, we do get a lot of complaints, us, and I say I can't handle the parking, that's the city parks part of parking out at Vets because it's just kind of straight. So when you're getting so many teams coming and going at one time, it's hard. Uh, 
you know, it'd be nice to have additional lighting so we can have some have some later games. We do have the one lighted field. We utilize that the best we can now. Um, scheduling that with the uh, parks department to uh, get lights turned on and how we utilize it. <coughs> Unfortunately, the way we need it in the summer is we need to have it as a, as a full size field because we have enough of that oldest age group. So then it's a it's a complex issue of scheduling the, the, the way we can. Um, some sort of outdoor field space or dome would be great. Indoor field space or dome would be great. Doesn't necessarily have to be a dome. There's also indoor fa facilities that <coughs> have turf. I mean, obviously Woodbury's one. Um, Eden Prairie's got another where it's got really nice indoor turf, but it's not a dome. It's a it's a solid structure. Um, and that can be utilized by all clubs within the city. We're not going to be the only club that would utilize something like that. We know baseball would because baseball uses a civic arena. We know lacrosse would. Lacrosse uses a civic arena as well. So just increasing some sort of space would be awesome in the city. Um, something I thought over the last couple weeks is um, maybe consider installing turf on just that lighted field. Um, turf can be painted so Little Raiders football, I know that's kind of an issue in the fall, can use it. Because we don't need the full size field in the fall. We only need one small field and that's actually for the city's adult recreational league. Um, so you could paint, you could easily, if you could turf one portion, that one field, just that portion, you could paint it for football, you could paint it for soccer for a full field, and you could even put two small fields on it, or lacrosse if need be. Just a few photos, here's from our rec academy last year. Those are that, that little goal down there is what you see installed all over the lines right now. <coughs> there are five sets of those out there. And that's a great size goal for the littlest kids. It's actually something that they can shoot at. And that's out there for anybody in the city to use. Because it's in the city park. And we want kids to use it. And we want citizens to use it and everything else. Here's our summer camp from last year. That would have been on the lighted field. That's one of our biggest goals out there. And then this year we had our U13 C2 boys just a couple weeks ago at the St. Croix Cup were champions. That's a hard tournament to be champions at because St. Croix is a huge club. They bring in a lot of people. Um, they have a lot of academy level teams there. Academy level team is something that we do not have here in Hastings because we don't have the facilities for it. We need an indoor facility for academy level play. Academy is basically year round soccer. Um, and with St. Croix, the biggest thing on that is they are on a, an MLS affiliate. You brought up Minnesota United. Minnesota has their own academy up in Blaine. Um, St. Croix is an MLS affiliate with Sporting KC out of Kansas City. So they're getting money from Kansas City coming up to um, the Stillwater area for a club. And our boys, we actually had two teams go over there and be champions um, this year. And then our U16 C2 boys were Rivertown Classic, not to be confused with River City. Um, Rivertown is out of Hudson. So that's what we have. We're open for questions from any of you guys. Um, there's our contact information for me and our vice president and president and our website. And all of our contact and emails are on our websites as well. So I have a question. Um, have you ever considered for the younger kids doing a weekday only program versus uh, including the weekends um, to like allow for, like especially in the summer, um, some families tend to not have all the weekends free for so I can say this as a as a coach um, our league play for our teams is during the week um, it's for the summer season in the fall because it gets dark so early a lot of those games are on the weekends but for yeah. summer play your league games are you know like my league games are Mondays and Wednesdays and then when we want to play in tournaments the first thing we do is send out a survey say hey parents which weekends are you around what do you have available we kind of build a tournament schedule around, you know, people's vacations and people's, you know, grandma and grandpa are in town or whatever it might be to kind of get around some of that. Because we do want kids to be in, in multiple, multiple sports if they can and other activities, especially during the school year because we start before school's out. So that is a big consideration for what we do is making sure kids can kind of be well-rounded and do some other things also. Okay. Okay. In, in that competitive level, that schedule is mandated by MYSA. So okay. typically your Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday for that for those play dates. Um, okay. Recreational wise, we do have recreation during the week. 
and there is also some weekends in there. A lot of their actual zoos are the weekends then during the summer months. When it comes to fall, like like Jeremy said, when it's fall time, it's basically all weekends. Okay. Okay. So can I answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like, my son, he's seven years old, and we basically have to tell the team, like, we won't be here any of the weekend days. So he plays Tuesdays and Saturdays. Dur during the summer months. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say we'll be here Tuesday. And I would say that's great. You know, I've had have, have players in the same situation, yeah. even at the competitive level, and that's perfect. Just let me know ahead of time, right? You know, like that's as a club, I, we don't have any aversion to that. You know, we want kids involved in doing things that their family needs to do too. Yeah. Cool. What's the general uh, resourcing for coaches <coughs> that are part of even the younger groups? Like, do you have, are you are you running clinics? Are they getting resources that are manuals and whatnot, or is it? Uh, yeah, what, what's the training behind that or the preparation for leading the younger groups? So you have some suckers like me who never did anything with soccer who, you know, said they'd help out when their kids were in preschool, um, and now I'm here. Um, and so there's some of that. Uh, but a lot of it is we have the two paid positions we have, the directors of coaching. Their real job during the season, before the season, is to help prepare coaches. Uh, and we're looking to bring in that same sort of position for the recreational side. We, that, that position's open on our website right now. Because um, it's easier to develop coaches, it's more efficient to develop coaches than it is players. And so that's one, that's one of our big focuses. Uh, this year is the first year we went to having separate directors of coaching for the boys and for the girls, was to get more time in front of those coaches with those experts in that field, um, to get training for the coaches specifically, because um, that's where we find success. So on, how about on the rec league side of things? So that's... Um, when I was a rec coach, there was a similar thing. We had the, the rec coordinator handle a lot of that. Um, at that point, I, it was a binder. You know, now a lot of our stuff is online. Uh, but then it was a binder of different drills to run. And then they usually have experienced coaches partnered up with new people. We kind of approached it that way. I haven't been as much of a part of the rec side of things here in the last couple of years. My kids are a little bit older. But um, that's the way we've done it in the past. Yeah. We, we do, for rec, we utilize parent volunteers. Um, HSC does offer, and I think SEAL is one of the ones that started up years ago, where if a coach, at least going through the travel program when you transition, sometimes if you're a coach and you want to coach, you're going to transition from your kid being in rec over to travel. Once you're kind of into that travel spot, you can start earning licenses through youth soccer association, the, the federal level. Um, and HSC has offered to pay for that licensing and it, it's minimal fees it's 50 60 bucks and it's some of it's online and like a one day eight hour session um, but you can go anywhere from a level is level a the highest up to d or d to a one way or the other everything you mentioned is sort of academy related you mentioned the core academy mm -hmm. is that's for coaches too Can you explain a little bit about your funding and, and costs for players? Um, I don't have the cost right in front of me. I do know if we had our website up, we have our costs compared to other clubs around us. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we are the lowest feed club in the area, and that included Woodbury, Cottage Grove, St. Croix. Um, St. Croix is kind of hard to compare because they have their academy and then they have their regular competitive. So I think those numbers included the regular competitive. Um, Northfield. We were the lowest out of all of them. Um, Roughly, I, don't, I don't pay it. My wife does all that, so I don't know yeah, what the numbers are. Uh, <laughs> I, I was just kind of curious yeah. because this is going on on TV. Here's yep. a good chance to give yep. a little pitch about. Um, so we are a nonprofit. <coughs> yep. And like our rec stuff, we try to break even at all times. Okay. Yep. We always figure out T-shirt costs, equipment costs. So we're, we're putting that cost on the family the least amount of possible on the rec yep. side. So it's a break even point. I know for my kids, I think to play both seasons, the spring and the fall, I think cost my kids about $450 for the year. Uh, that's about half of, I think, what Cottage Grove charges. So yeah. um, we've been real competitive that way. And uh, you're pretty close with Red Wing or not? I don't know about Red Wing. I know River Falls is closer to our cost. 
Okay. Look mostly around the Twin Cities ones. I guess I haven't looked at Red Wing. Yeah, and specifically, I, I, I thought about throwing that on, on this presentation. We do have a, a, a graphic on our website that shows our costs last year compared to other clubs right around us. I know fa families are always looking at what it costs to send their kids to different sports. Yeah, sure. Exactly. And one good point to throw on there too is we never turn anybody away for uh, lack of ability to pay. We have a scholarship program okay. there. Um, and they just, that's just as simple as contacting our treasurer um, and they handle that piece of it. Nobody else knows. It's just a, we want kids playing soccer. That's our, mm -hmm. our number one priority. Yep. Very good. I think you've got a, our treasurer's got a, a formula figured out and he works with actually, I believe, United Way to yep. figure out that scholarship. Yep. You had mentioned uh, the spring and fall sessions, the two different sessions. Do you, are you just like, with baseball, I'm assuming it's two different, full, complete different seasons. So if you want to play both seasons, you pay for spring, then you pay for fall. Correct. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, the lights on that lit field, during, especially during the fall, how often are they actually used out there? Because you brought up a really valid point as far as the Little Raider football. Yep. And I don't know, probably five years ago when I'm like, why are they playing football on a baseball field that's not set up at all for football? Um, I, I, I can tell you from my experience the last few years um, that we don't use the lighted field for lights in the fall for a big field because that age group is playing high school yep. and high school league rules prevent them from playing NYSA club. soccer, club soccer during the high school season. And the fall games are always and the fall And the fall games by NYSA guidelines is always on weekends so we can schedule them early in the morning. Um, the lights that I know of the last few years have been with the adult rec league, which is actually run through the parks department. Um, I have played on that rec league. I enjoy playing on that rec league. I look forward to playing on that rec league every year. That's my exercise for the year. <laughs> um, and, I, and I enjoy it. And getting back to that, you could paint that as a football field and as a soccer field. Yep. Or you could turf it as a football field and a small soccer because when it's adult rec league it's a smaller field it's not the full size it's more of the u um 11 12 size we know we can't run that long <laughs> right <laughs> so have you looked at the cost of what it would take to put the turf down because <coughs> obviously with with uh, todd field getting the turf now there's some talk of that and there's known costs already looked at what's the cost of doing that out at vets if i i don't know the cost of that um i do know that my son had the opportunity to go down to a, a superb complex down in St. Louis um, just a few weeks ago and play on their fields. And so I kind of just Googled real quick, what's the cost of turf? And if I remember correctly for new turf, it was, I don't know, maybe you would know, Chris, $4 a square foot or something like that. I mean- Close to a million bucks to turf a field. Yeah. That'd be my guess, yeah. Yeah. Um, but what surprised me is that you can buy used turf. Like when Woodbury turned their turf, you know, Woodbury tore their turf out three years after putting it back in. You can buy their turf at a significantly reduced rate. Some of it's painted, some of it's not. It just depends on what you're looking for. Um, now, when you say close to a million dollars on a field, I don't know, is that just for that one field or is that for, I mean, I, yeah. I, know, it's not, it's, I know it's more than just throwing turf down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, I mean, there's a variety of prep that has to happen yeah. for the, the surface underneath of it. Um, but yeah, that'd be a you know a standard, hundred you know three hundred and thirty feet by, whatever, sure. hundred and fifty feet type of deal. I think the benefit you're looking at though on something like that is you could paint it football, so it can be used in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, you could paint one full size soccer, for our opportunities in the spring and summer, and you could paint two small, U eleven twelve soccer's on that same field, and then the city rec league can use it for that, or if HFC needed it for something else. And if you had to throw lacrosse in there, you could. To so find one of those nice lottery tickets. in town. <laughs> <laughs> we're buying lottery thing. tickets, right, Sean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <we're trying. laughs> Would that be a, that service then you could, in theory, put a bubble on that then, right? That would be. For about another million bucks. bucks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that I have looked into is how much a bubble costs. And yeah. that's. I think it's, I know it's expensive. You can do a temporary. I mean, yeah. I don't know what everybody is familiar with. I'm sure Chris is. You can do a temporary t domes and permanent domes. Temporary is meant to be taken down April, May-ish, mm -hmm. and put back up October, November-ish. Um, they do typically cost less than 
whole structure dome. Is that, a, Chris, is that a part of the comprehensive plan at all, having that, you know, the rec fields are obviously and all that, but is that? I don't know area? that, um, I don't know that a specific indoor type of facility like that is mentioned. Okay. Um, but that would be something that um, can be explored as an, as an idea, you know, as, yeah. it, as it comes forward. Certainly, and it's kind of evaluating the needs. And you know, one of the reasons why uh, we're inviting uh, the associations uh, into to provide that background and information uh, to really give this commission an idea of what is going on in this community. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty staggering once you hear it all uh, from each individual association. Right? I'm involved in the softball association. I kind of know what's going on with that, but soccer, I, I have an idea uh, because. Yeah. We talk with Sean and others, and we, you know, we work on the fields and whatnot. But the numbers of kids that are participating, I didn't, I didn't know it was uh, to that level. So, so one of the, one of the uh, members pulled up the registration fee just for TV purposes. Uh, for just fall, you're talking 100, 100 to 115 bucks, depending on age. And uh, summer only 215 up to 315 again, depending on age. And then a fifth, what was it, a fifteen dollar discount? It looks like roughly for, for two. We offer discounts depending on when, <coughs> on when you register. Yep. Right. You know, an early bird registration gets a discount. Um, some of those costs don't include uniform, um, so that may and that should be on the website. But okay. some clubs offer the uniform as part of their fee. We don't, but uniform runs about a hundred bucks. Hundred bucks for two years. years. Yeah, we keep uniforms for two years because so we don't want families buying them every year. I know for my kids, if we're going longer than two years, it seems like they've outgrown it anyway. So um, that's kind of what we've looked at as a club. And the other thing that that doesn't cost, that doesn't include is, is tournament fees. And typically what we do then is the, if a team wants to play in a tournament, um, my daughter's on Jeremy's team and they're playing in a couple tournaments, that tournament fee is divided among all the players and we pay that out of our own pocket. Right, and that's pretty standard too. Cindy, but same thing with baseball for tournaments, right? Does that sound right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's. Pr I, I know when my kid was. So if, in you're on, if you're on that website, if you're on if you're on our website with that page of our costs, somewhere on that same page should be that spreadsheet graphic of the other clubs right around us. So encourage people that are interested to visit the website and learn more. Yeah. HFCsoccer.org. I think I'd be interested in the future uh, when it comes to. I've been a little bit of a proponent of the indoor parks area, but also. Uh, indoor fields as well just because the usage in the summer so you know as those conversations continue to happen or you guys research that I think yeah. we would love to hear maybe what options would be available or per yeah. potential proposals for that to see if that's even a viable option but it is something that I think is is very possible for especially Minnesota I mean how right. often do we hide our kids and you talk about the fields that you use for indoor they're dedicated to hockey the whole entire winter yeah. um, and so I think there's I think there, there should be, but there should be some serious thought when it comes to it in the future on what that could look like for the city of Hastings. And the $20,000 expenditure for us is two hours a week. Yeah. During that month, so During those those winter that months. November through yeah. yep. April, May. Yeah. That's how Runs much we spend. Dome rental, just for if you're looking at it as part of your plan, if you're renting to other people, um, we pay down there $450 an hour for yeah. that. It's the size of one soccer field, like one full-size field, yeah. um, and that's on the low <coughs> end. That's a, that's a good deal. So, and that is considered a temporary structure down there. Yeah. When they built that, and and that is privately owned by three families. Can you? Um, I guess I never played soccer growing up, so I'm not super knowledgeable about this. But <coughs> what is the difference between? playing say for like the football club rather than playing on like a high school team or middle school team like through the school so your school teams are run by the high school league right at middle school or high school level are all run by there you're typically practicing after school um, the coaches are provided by the school district and those games are happening right after school you're bused there on you know a school bus um, club soccer kind of like little raiders football being outside of school would it's run through the club the organization runs it in this case like we're affiliated with mysa so they do a lot of the scheduling and bracketing like we talked about uh, whereas in the school setting it would be taken care of by those athletic directors for the school and so um, like in the past in the fall my kids played for school and for club 
some kids will pick one or the other in the fall. Some kids do both. So is there a reason that you would want to pick one or the other, or is it kind well, of just like a personal? So for any, any, for any, soccer, you don't have the option to play in the spring. That's only a fall sport. So our kids who want to play a lot of, for school, yep. Okay. Um, so like my kids who want to play soccer all the time, they'll do fall soccer for school, do fall soccer for club, they'll do winter training, and then they'll play summer and fall season again for us, so. And that, and that school-wise, you cannot play club and school once you reach basically ninth grade. Okay, so can so I have to the, choose one or the other? Have, well, we don't, we don't, even, offer we don't even offer it yeah. in the fall because of that. Just in the fall, though? Just in the fall, yep. because of, because of that reason. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to, to play strictly soccer in the fall at that age level, and not be school, you're going to go to an academy level team or a premier level team. You're going to go to Saint Croix. You're going to go to um, it's now Rev, but Dakota Rev. You're going to go to MTA, Minnesota Thunder Academy, um, Shattuck St. Mary's, and you're paying a significant amount more. Um, Three Saint Three to five thousand a season, probably. Saint Croix Academy for one year, eleven months worth of play is about twenty-two hundred dollars. So. Thank you. Plus travel. Plus travel. Plus travel. Um, you had mentioned um, that you would like at some point to have a tournament come back to Hastings. What would that take? What would be some hurdles that you see, and how many people? families, teams are you thinking about? What kind of venue would you need? Uh, we're in the early stages of that piece. <coughs> you know, it comes down to one big thing is space, but there are, there's a lot of space in Hastings that can be used. It'd be a matter of coordinating some of that. Um, between the high school, middle school, and then parks, there's a lot of, there are a lot of soccer fields in town that can be made available. That's pretty standard when you go to tournaments in other towns. Uh, we were in Albertville this weekend for a tournament, and we were at, I think, three different parks in the middle school they're setting up there in Albertville. So that's kind of the setting that's coordinating that is a big part of the work. Um, and so just now we're starting to piece together some of, from the manpower end of things, what we would need first, because you need all of that in place before you start registering anybody for a tournament. You know, the, the day of is always a lot less work than the months leading up to it. Months or years. Years, probably more we're, I mean, we're, we're starting to, as a board, we're starting to discuss it now for maybe not even next year, but the year after. It's just yep. that much work. Um, the tournaments we held in the past, the River City Rumble in the past, was always out at vets. So we were able to utilize vets. The key on a tournament is because we mentioned there's three, four, or five tournaments in the metro area or throughout the state or throughout the Midwest a weekend. You got to get people to your tournament. You know, should we go to Hastings for a tournament or do we want to go to Cottage Grove for a tournament? Cottage Grove's been running theirs for many, many years. Woodbury's been running theirs for many, many years. Northfield, Jesse James Day's tournament down there, they've been running theirs for many, many years. So our thought now is we need to come up with something that's different. I don't know if we want to say it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Iowa runs a very good tournament that uh, is very unique because not all age groups get to play underneath lights. So, so they do a twilight tournament where teams are playing late. Like teams will come in for a, a 2 a.m. game, a 3 a.m. 3 a.m. game, um, and. They, had, they fill up, like that yeah. That fills up fast every year, that tournament. That'll actually be this upcoming weekend, I believe. Um, and you have teams from all over the Midwest go to that because the kids are like, I don't know if the parents like it, but the kids really like it. Um, and it's just kind of a- It's different. It's a different experience. And so something, not necessarily like that, but just something kind of outside the box again to, to draw some of that interest level for kids back into it. Baseball is what I know. So when, when I know HYAA hosts their tournaments like they have coming up these next two weekends, the goal of that is to win the tournament because then you get a bid to a state, a state run statewide tournament. Is there something like that for soccer where if they win your tournament, they get a bid to a state one or is it just, hey, we won the Hastings tournament? So all of the bracketing throughout the year, your season is what determines your postseason play in soccer. So tournaments do not factor into that um, section. So like in our section, there are a certain number of teams. The top seed out of your bracket is an automatic qualifier for state. Everybody else has a, then a single elimination tournament to make it into state. Um, and that way, part of the reason soccer's using that is so that people aren't cherry picking tournaments to hopefully sneak into a tournament, get some lower level quality play and, and sneak in. 
it kind of levels the playing field for um, comparison wise to know that your top seeded teams are truly making it to the tournament. Uh, if you make that state tournament, you are likely, uh, my son played in the fall tournament three years ago and you had to be undefeated and win by a max differential on five out of your six games in order to make the tournament. So you get, you get your top, there's no gimmies at the state level, uh, you get your top teams down there. And that tournament, that, when we talk about that tournament, that's scheduled by MYSA. Yep. So if we were to host the River City Rumble again, which is what it was years ago for us, it's basically bragging rights for winning that tournament. Yep. But that's why we got to make our tournament unique and different to say they won that tournament, we won that tournament. I mean, for our boys to go up to St. Croix and win, have two of our teams go up there and win, that's a big tournament for St. Croix Academy and bringing in teams from all over for that. So for our boys to go there and win that, that is, that is very pride. Any other questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Huh? <laughs> um, our next presentation we have Justin Fortney. He is going to go over the Parks and Rec portion of the 2040 Comprehensive Plan. And um, just be aware that uh, Justin is looking for a recommendation of support to forward this to city, or to city Council for consideration from us after. So. Thank you very much. I'm, as you mentioned, I'm Justin Fortney, City Planner for the City of Hastings. I've been here for 11 years, and this is the first time I've been to the Parks and Recreation Commission. So thanks for having me here. You're, you're welcome every month, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the 2040 Comprehensive Plan is an update of the Comprehensive Plan um, that was called the 2030 Comprehensive Plan that um, we had done in 2008. At that time, it was uh, um, built from the ground up, and we had a separate consultant that did the parks and recreation chapter. And um, it's a pretty extensive chapter. It's actually, it's larger than a typical parks chapter of a comprehensive plan. It's actually closer to like a, a parks master plan. Um, and the reason why we didn't update this year is because in, or th this time is because in 2008, um, Things uh, moved pretty slowly development-wise since then, and so um, a lot of it is still valid. We didn't uh, meet any of the goals that uh, we thought we would have, of course, for development. And so since a lot of the plan hasn't been used up, we just uh, spent more time uh, on this plan looking at uh, working with the public and community um, for input to make sure that we were on the right track, and so we spent a lot of time uh, looking at that, and I'll go over some of those uh, things that we did this time. Our, the steering committee that we used for the comprehensive plan was about 19 members of the community, uh, including uh, two members of the Park and Recreation Commission, uh, Jordi Polina and Nicole De Palma. And um, we started meeting uh, over a year ago, and uh, we just recently finished um, working on uh, the input uh, for the plan changes. The plan contains the elements that you see up there. Uh, the main chapter is the land use chapter. All the chapters kind of have to do with uh, development and the physical uh, growth of a, of a community. Land use would be um, kind of uh, different uses of land around the city, commercial, um, residential, parks, things of that nature. Then there's, of course, transportation, which would include roads and uh, sidewalks and trails and transit. Then there's water resources, which is actually three chapters, water supply, which is essentially drinking water. Then there's uh, surface water, which is storm water. And then there's uh, sewer. Then there's parks and trails, housing, economic competitiveness, and a new one for this um, uh, plan w is resilience. Um, <clears throat> rather than doing a, a chapter on it, we did kind of a, um, a, a just a section in some of the different uh, chapters. Resilience is just kind of how you adapt to uh, changes in uh, the economy and environment and still stay, stay successful. And then the last chapter would be the implement, implementation chapter. The project timeline. 
uh, started in May 2017, which is when we began looking at all of the plans that we already had adopted, the demographics that were given to us by the Metropolitan Council to use for the plan, and the started the um, project website. We um, put out a survey online. I also printed uh, many copies and delivered them to different areas, different churches and uh, organizations in the city. And um, we had a, we launched a crowdsource online mapping tool that I'll go over. We held a pop-up meeting at Rivertown Days. We held a public workshop <coughs> with a SWOT analysis, um, which is strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and um, Threat. uh, threats, thank you. And then we had a Joint Council Planning Commission workshop, which uh, did another SWOT analysis of their own. Uh, we had key stakeholder interviews over two full days. We had a pop-up meeting um, in December at uh, Holiday Hoopla downtown. And then just recently in May, we had the draft open house here at City Hall. And this month we are doing, uh, bringing it to the commissions for, for input and uh, direction before it goes to City Council uh, next month. After that, it will go to uh, surrounding jurisdictions, uh, neighboring communities, DNR, uh, some other organizations for input. And then it would go to the City Council for uh, public hearing and adoption at the end of the year before it's ultimately um, given to the Metropolitan Council. The activities, um, for the plan would start started with uh, input and engagement with the community. And then um, we go through the existing conditions in town, look at the existing plans that we have out there. And then it goes to visions, goals, and policies, and then ultimately to implementation. Uh, some of the conditions that we have physically is that the city is 8,200 acres, 13 square miles. The population has doubled since 1970, and 19% of our, ap of our uh, population came between 2000 and 2010. Um, uh, population by age uh, is kind of interesting. There's uh, two kind of anomalies that we noticed is our population drastically drops after um, retirement age uh, for both male and female. And there's also a large drop in the age of 15 to 19, um, <clears throat> possibly from uh, people leaving for college, 18 and 19 year olds. Um, and then also we did hear a lot of public input that there's not a lot of senior housing um, in, in town. And so it's possible that uh, a good portion of those are, are leaving at that time and uh, maybe downsizing in other communities. The population and households in Hastings, the first column is uh, population and the second columns are the households. You can see in 1970 it was 12,195 and it about doubled in 2016, well, was the last figures we have, to 22,400. Um, it's proposed by the Metropolitan Council that we'll have 28,800 uh, as a population in 2040, which would be 6,400 additional uh, people coming to Hastings. Yeah, you probably can't read the numbers on this one, um, but it's the average household size in Hastings. The first column is in 1990, the average household was 2.76 uh, people. And in 2016, it's dropped to 2.42 people in a household. And on the next slide, uh, the pie chart, you can kind of see why. Um, the largest section is yellow, which is families without children at 34%. Then non-family households is 8.45 and live alone is 28.6. Um, all those are uh, without children. Uh, the two on the left side, the purple and the orange are um, a total of about 27% families with children. Uh, the orange one is unmarried families. So there's a good portion of the city without children in the household. I had mentioned that we had some stakeholder uh, and focus group interviews that were done by uh, our consultant, <coughs> uh, Chris Jansen with MSA Professional Services. They held uh, two days of stakeholder interviews and focus groups 
They met with uh, 25 uh, people participated in those. There was 20 to 25 minute session, sessions for individuals and there was uh, four uh, focus group sessions that lasted an hour long um, from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. on uh, about there on both those days with the later uh, one on Thursday. Examples of some of those participant groups would be business owners, developers, athletic associations, realtors, uh, Dakota County Community Development Association, um, and the county transportation, some artist groups, uh, historic preservationists, and uh, national resor national natural resource professionals. Um, I'd mentioned that we had uh, a crowdsource mapping program that was launched on the project website. It's still up there um, if you want to see what a lot of the comments were. Essentially, somebody could um, put a pinpoint on the map. You can zoom in on the map and, um, and write comments about uh, different things. You can write um, a dangerous intersection or you can write about uh, a park you like or pretty much anything you'd like to do. Um, I zoomed in here just uh, just a couple of examples. Um, in J.C. Park, somebody put uh, a, a park push pin by uh, the boat launch and talked about uh, some of the issues that are there with that boat launch being a little dangerous because of the, the <coughs> side current uh, some um, and not having a, a dock adjacent to it. And um, somebody added one that said that uh, more trails would be nice in that park and some interpretive uses. And somebody added a comment to that one that thought a snowshoeing trail loop um, around the Flint Hills land would be nice. Um, one downtown said uh, a boat dock downtown would be uh, beneficial. And then in the center here, um, this is how you can read the comments over here. It, it says, um, what's the point of this dock? It's too far from downtown too far from the boat launch. No fishing's allowed, but that's all that it's used for. Somebody added a comment that uh, it would be nice if the dock could be enhanced to support launching of kayaks and canoes. Um, so there's a lot of these throughout town. Um, I'd say a good number of them are related to parks. And so um, if you go to the, um, the project website, which is hastings2040plan.com, you can read all those comments. Um, we did a community survey that was participated by about 125 um, people in town um, from all different age groups. And uh, I'll, I just have a couple examples on here of uh, some that are related to parks. This is what type of bike facility do you feel safe uh, using? And 80% said uh, paved, uh, well, I, I should mention 35 people skipped this who probably don't ride bikes. Um, but 80% uh, said paved off-road trails um, are, are very safe. Um, they feel safe on them. And then the next one would be on-road dedicated lanes uh, with physical barrier from cars, about 40%. And then unpaved off-road trail was third. And then fourth uh, drops off significantly. Um, well, it's, it's still 25%, but they would uh, rather use a sidewalk even if there's a bike lane on the road. And then um, below that would be on-road um, dedicated bike lane with no barrier. And then down to on-road, no barrier from cars. Um, just 10% would feel safe on a situation like that. That could be due to like the rise in distracted driving, uh, yeah. you know, being on the same road without any kind of bump or anything before you hit a bike. I'm guessing. True. I, I also wondered if um, when people are filling this out, they had a road pictured in their head, uh, maybe like 61 or something, and maybe they weren't thinking of local roads where some of our you know, connections happen through. Yeah. And um, so what do you consider to be a reasonable walking or biking distance to a park? 27% thought a quarter mile or less, 31% a half mile or less, 23% one mile or less, 15% would go up to one to five miles, but 4% uh, would not walk no matter how close it was. <laughs> Areas that need improvement safety for bike or pedestrian use. Uh, this is more of a transportation thing, um, but um, most of them, there was 25 random areas that people highlighted. They're all unique. 
um, but there was a high percentage of uh, repeat um, sections, and, and one of them was the pool, roadside park, and tennis courts. And then um, from there, there was, there was a lot of mentions of different areas on Highway 61, 55, and 316. Um, so I've also heard, you know, comments, of course, from those areas, because those are areas that, you know, I suppose kids travel to on their own, and so, um, you know, that can be a difficult area getting across. Um, obviously, you'd want to go across the intersection, and, and those uh, facilities aren't really at a, a lit intersection, so people probably would like to cut in between those. Um, some community strengths and weaknesses came out of um, a lot of the SWOT analysis, also um, from the community surveys that were done. This one's related to um, why you live in Hastings and, and you know, maybe what keeps you know, people from wanting to live here. The green ones are uh, strengths, obviously, great parks and trail systems, access to the Mississippi, small town character, schools, downtown history and character, riverfront, regional destination, regional access is increasingly accessible, and metro area resources. Some of the weaknesses include lack of transit within town, lack of regional transit, maintenance of key routes. I believe they're probably talking about maybe street maintenance, um, affordable quality housing, housing for seniors, young families, and workforce, need more employers, pedestrian safety in the commercial corridors. Uh, the parks and trail uh, section that I'll go through, number two, uh, has the goals for the 2040 plan. Um, and then under those goals is the strategies and objectives to, uh, to realize those. This is just the first, the first example, which is more of a general one. Um, PT would stand for parks and trails. And the parks open space and trail system plan is to improve a uh, cohesive, effective, and efficient comprehensive system plan. And the strategies and objectives would be to continue to evaluate and update the system plan and recreational needs of the community to ensure adequate parks, athletic facilities, open spaces, and trails are provided, and to use the plan for the purpose of guiding the implementation of those. The other goals, um, there's eight of them, uh, would include parks and open space acquisition and development, trail corridors acquisition and development, natural resources stewardship, community participation, partnerships, funding, and recreation programs. As I mentioned, the chapter is divided into six sections. The first one is uh, the community input and values statement, which is a brief overview and includes public input um, for the plan. Two is um, a mission statement and the goals and objectives for the parks and open space and trail system that I had mentioned just a few slides before. And three is, uh, talks about uh, partnerships with uh, athletic associations and school district and local park plans, community parks, athletic facilities, facility supply and demand, and private and public open space throughout the city. Section four is the trail system plan. <laughs> Um, it talks about uh, trail planning, sidewalks, natural trails, bikeways, regional trails, trailheads. And section five um, is natural resources stewardship plan. It goes over the ecological and economic perspective, threats to ecological systems, ecological system safeguards, enhancing wildlife habitat, water resource management uh, for uh, essentially, uh, you know, stormwater and wetland type areas. And the section six is the implementation plan. Um, it uh, goes over the commitments, prioritization, implementation strategies, trails, parks, natural resources, athletic facilities and partnerships, funding, local association relationships, scheduling of fields and facilities, and public involvement. Um, and I'd like to go over kind of what kind of things were updated, mostly in this, in this plan, um, which was done extensively with uh, participation in 2008 from the Park and Rec Commission and, uh, and staff. Um, a lot of lot, these kind of chapter things and um, 
a lot of these trail plans and bikeways and regional trails and trailheads, all those really weren't updated in this, in this plan. Um, park staff went over, and went over the plan and, and thought all that is still relevant. And um, the public input that we had received from the public highly rated um, everything that uh, the city has as far as parks and trails. Um, and it, it seemed very positive that uh, the things that were being done were, uh, were, were being done correctly. So there was no need to change the direction of, of any of those. A lot of the things that were updated um, would be some of the goals and objectives to stay relevant to the input we received. Um, a lot of the things that have changed um, from, from the time the last plan was done, like uh, Riverside Front Renaissance had kind of been completed and some other, some other goals that had been met. And so um, it was more just uh, kind of an update uh, to stay current and relevant. And then, of course, the, it was reformatted to fit the, the format um, of the 2040 plan and to, to look more like the rest of the plan because, like I said, the plan was originally done by a different consultant before, so it never really matched our plan, so we just kind of um, reorganized it and, uh, and changed things around. So with that, I can answer any questions uh, of the commission. Um, one thing, Justin, that I kind of made a note of before when we were talking about stakeholders, um, was it kind of underneath the, the business owner or was there any input from health care at all, um, in it especially related to because a few years ago, you know, we had the, had the AHA commission and I'm just wondering if we're getting any feedback that way. Um, yes. Um, it, you know, it was a while ago now. Um, I don't have the list with me, but um, we did reach out to uh, Alina and we reached out to the hospital. Um, I think there was a, a phone interview uh, with, with somebody from Alina. Um, I can't remember if there was any, any, other, any, any, any other ones related to, to healthcare. There may have been. There, there was uh, 25 individuals. I just kind of went off the top of my head on that on that list of like, you know, kind of eight categories, but I, I didn't get them all. There's a lot of information in <laughs> looking at it going. Uh, yeah, well. um, in feedback from tennis we had in last month, hearing from soccer this month, knowing the facilities that we have out at Veterans Park that I'm active at darn near daily. Um, I, I scanned through the information that was emailed prior and I found like three sentences on Veterans Park. And that's a major facility that HYAA uses, the soccer teams use, the Hawks use, the high school will use it sometimes. And there's three sentences in the plan that I saw. I may have missed it because there's a lot of information there. The athletic complex out there is a category of types of parks um, and the comp plan itself doesn't get down to the nitty gritty of um, operation of that. More so it is, is there a community need for an athletic facility and what sorts of things should that have in it? And that's in the, that's in the plan. Okay. Um, a facility master plan would be where you're, where you're going to renovate or construct a new facility and that would really get down to the nitty-gritty of how everything is oriented and what sizes it is and what sort of facilities would be there and at those points in time uh, would be where uh, the associations and the users like that would be a really focused effort to bring all those people to the table for to make that for this community okay so as part of this comprehensive plan we have a facility that's what this plans acknowledging and and is it putting ideas on improvements to that facility? Because I've seen pictures on various Facebook, especially like with Sean talking about soccer being relevant today, um, the different facilities that he's traveled to. I've seen different facilities that baseball teams have traveled to. I've been to them, and I look at Veterans Park and go, what the 
heck do we have going on here? As far as just, it, it, it's old. So is, is that something that, the, I mean, you're talking 22 years out, is there a, a plan to make improvements out there? Is there a plan to make improvements at Pioneer Park? That's, is, is that de supposed to be detailed a little bit in here or uh, being not new to the process, that's yeah, not where exactly, I'm coming from. Not exactly how it would be done in there. It is um, in the 2030 plan listed as a priority and that's called out very specifically. So that then gives the comp plan as a guiding document and the goals that were referenced in the beginning um, are all of all of the goals of the, the plan that have been derived from the plan. And there are priorities that are listed in the end. Um, there's a variety of things, athletic facilities um, or an athletic complex is listed as a one of the priorities for Hastings through the comp plan. Okay. So it doesn't prescribe how to do that, it just lists it as a priority. List, we yep. need, it says we need to do work at or we need to plan on this type of stuff, I thought process out there. I would, I would say that it acknowledges that there should be some consideration given to this type of facility for the future of Hastings. Okay. Yeah, if I could add um, the comprehensive plan, other chapters that deal with other things like um, uh, you know, land use, it, it'll point to like some areas maybe along Vermilion Street that uh, have a lot of issues and it, it'll, it'll uh, recommend that maybe a, 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 a specific uh, neighborhood plan be done to address those issues. Um, the same thing would be probably for a park. Um, if there was stuff in, in a general 30,000 foot view plan like this um, about changes to a park, I think it, it probably wouldn't be focused enough to, uh, to be a plan that you could follow to have a product that you we're really hoping for. Yeah, the big thing for me is being new to the whole process, because what is this, like my fourth meeting, I think. Um, just making sure I'm understanding what it is that we're looking at and what it is that we're making recommendations on at the end is, you know, is it adequate or, you know, this what it's supposed to be type of thing. So. Yeah, and as just, Justin just mentioned, uh, the comp plan is really a 30,000 foot level look. Uh, where you get into master planning efforts, those are those are the you know just above the grass kind of look. How's everything going to work? Um, so this is uh, part. This is one chapter in the overall comprehensive plan for the city of Hastings. And again, it's looking out at the estimates of population in 2040 and um, predicting and suggesting what sort of facilities, infrastructure, et cetera, are going to be necessary to uh, accommodate that population in the future. As we're growing, what else do we need? Where streets, sewers, housing, parks, trails, all that stuff. Chris, isn't, isn't the process here, and Justin can jump in on this, but once the plan moves on from this commission and goes to the city, and once it gets through the uh, Met Council and comes back and it's the plan we live with, it's part of this commission's responsibility to execute some of this or at least evaluate what was put down in paper and you know, get an understanding of what the city wants and needs, what the city can afford, and how we move forward. Yes, um, the way that I equate the comprehensive plan for Parks and Rec is that's what prescribes the work that we do. So we, we take that comp plan, we look at it very carefully, and then we look to plan um, our future. What are we gonna do? Uh, what are our staff gonna be doing? What sorts of um, desires do this, the community have? Uh, and we've gathered that, we have that document, we have that, um, we have that direction. And it was a very involved process uh, where the entire community was invited to participate in many different ways and some serious focused efforts were, were made to engage uh, with the community. So it's our, it's our Park and Rec Bible. Um, Justin, forgive me for not knowing this, I should. Will there be, for the CPC, will there be any more open public meetings between now and December? Um, yeah, the, the, the workshop with the city council would probably be, it would be a public meeting. Okay. And then um, 
when the city council uh, adopts it, we'd be holding a public hearing. Great. And um, I just want to tell you, it was really a pleasure to be working on that. It was amazing. I hope that if, when something like this comes up again, that you all throw your hat in the ring because it really opens your eyes about what's going on with the community now and how we're looking forward. Um, and I would highly encourage all of you to really take a look at what is on the website because it's really, it's simple to understand even for people like me, but it really lays out what we talked about and where we're going with this. So r thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, thank you for assisting on that. Yeah. Is uh, there a motion for our recommendation to support this? So move. I second. Okay. It is moved and seconded that this commission sends our recommendation of support and for this to city council. Any further discussion from the commission? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New business. Yay. Yay. <laughs> uh, yes, Commission, uh, you have before you a draft of a revenue, Parks and Recreation Revenue and Pricing Policy that I've been working on for an undisclosed amount of time. Um, really, what this is about is trying, is developing a policy on how the Parks and Recreation Department uh, prices things, anywhere from a pair of goggles at the pool to a hour of ice rental at the arena, um, and, and everything in between. So, and specifically focused on the programs that we offer, um, if it's a youth development program versus an adult athletic league, um, I have historically um, shot for some percentages, revenue recapture percentages, and that's some of the information that uh, I'm looking for feedback on from this commission. So currently with, uh, I'm gonna say youth programs and activities, uh, if we were to develop a youth ultimate Frisbee league, I'm gonna be looking for 120% revenue recapture, so that is 20% 20 20 beyond what the actual costs are to administer that program. What that 20, what, what's not involved, and this is in my head, uh, is the administrative part of that. Um, so 100% of the direct costs, so that's all the Frisbees that it would take, all the cones that it would take, um, any of the staff that actually work that event any of the flyers that go out, the communications, all those sorts of things for the direct delivery of service. Uh, the 20% is an effort to help recapture some of the costs for the administrative side of things. Our recreation programming staff, um, me, if you want to call it that, the fact that we have a Parks and Rec facility, the joint maintenance facility, we have the lights on, we have stuff, we've got overhead. So that's what that 20% is for. Um, and that's on the lower end of what a revenue recapture would be. Our adult athletic leagues, we're aiming for 150%. And you'll see that triangle in there from green play. It goes from the base of the fees, right, where it is a, a fantastic community event, um, the stuff that Paige does for us, the kickoff or the national park celebration. We're not collecting any fees for that. That's just good stuff for the community. And that's how we engage the community and that's, that's how we wanna build our relationship within the community. As you step up, you get into other things that are, this is fantastic for the community, we should keep doing this. We gotta charge a little bit of a fee uh, to start covering some of what we do. You know, so those are um, subsidized by taxpayer dollars. And the more we can get, the better, but we wanna keep it affordable and attainable and reachable for as many as possible. And you climb all the way up that ladder to where it's something that is a very direct benefit for one individual. It could be a soccer team, it could be you know a, a rock climbing program, but yeah, a yoga a yoga class. 
the only people that get any benefit from that are the people that are actually participating. It should not be subsidized by the taxpayers. So that's kind of the spectrum of those things. <coughs> and we, um, as we look to develop programs uh, and events, we take all of this into consideration. What's, what's the overall purpose of what we're doing and where should it land on the spectrum? Um, so that's some of the feed, some of the items that I'm wanting feedback on through this draft policy, hoping that you've all had some time to read and reflect and um, prepare some questions for me and, and help give me some directions for uh, how this should work and feel in Hastings. And if there's any questions about specific uh, items in here, feel free to ask. I wanna bounce this around a little bit. And um, you know, in the end, like I say, looking for some comments, recommendations, edits, and just to generally discuss this. I'm not looking to walk out of here with a refined document tonight, um, but I wanna take your guys' guidance and, and wrap that into this and bring it back to you. So with that, fire away. Chris, I guess <coughs> I would ask that when you're looking at it and, and you're, the breakdown of like 100% and then 120% or 100% and plus, I think when you're looking at the big picture, it's like, okay, the service activity or the um, behind the scenes costs, and that might, that might not be known, but to me, it makes more sense. That should be the round number up to, that would say 100%. Because if you're looking at it and what's the cost yeah, there's, there's a cost for the, the um, physical part of the things that take, require the, make the activity happen, but the behind the scene things that like pay for wages for people to do the prep work and other things like that, that should be an item that would be, okay, when you're paying 100% of the cost, I mean, to me it seems more rational to say, okay, here's 100% of the cost than, oh, here's 150% of the cost. It's just a mindset thing that would be, um, I feel, more appropriately stated if it was, okay, this is 100% cost with including all those other items that you're uh, suggesting we use under um, 120 up to 150%. I understand, so you're looking for uh, the full cost. Right. Indirect and direct costs. Yes. Um, and that may be difficult to get it. <laughs> there we go. Um, so my challenge in that is uh, deciphering all of the costs that we could possibly include. So if I do a, since soccer is here, a youth soccer program at one of our city facilities, um, my challenge then becomes, um, well, we're gonna mow that field, we're gonna fertilize that field, we're gonna irrigate that field, we're gonna repair that irrigation once, twice, three times a year, we're gonna repair that mower five times a year, uh, we bought that mower, uh, I'm paying somebody to sit in that mower, we're paying for their benefits to sit in that mower, well, yeah, but <laughs> it does. And at the same time, we still own that facility, we're still gonna do those same things irregardless of that program. Where do I draw the line? And don't forget that mower is used on baseball fields, yep. that mower is used in yep. city parks, yep. that person's being paid to work city parks. So what percentage is strictly for that one soccer game? Yes. That's really hard to determine. It is, and I've run some, of, I have run some of the calculations. You know, I've run depreciation costs on that. I know what my staff time is. I know what the time is to get from our shop there, I know about how much we spend on it annually for maintenance. Um, I know how long it takes to mow that facility, how long it takes the guys to sharpen the blades and change the oil. And, you know, we know that stuff. Uh, it's, I'm looking for the but fours, right? But for this program, we wouldn't do any of this. And with some of those outside activities, we don't have that because we're still gonna do the same thing. We're still gonna mow, we're still gonna irrigate, we're still gonna, so I struggle, um, but I'm totally open to 
uh, assistance and or feedback along those lines. Can I, can I clarify uh, specifically the area that we're seeming to hone in on is this idea of whether it's the 120%, 150% on programs. The practical question I have in the midst of that is that, uh, you know, you talk about staffing and whatnot, and this is just a, a question I have for clarification. You've already budgeted for, you've already budgeted for staff, correct, mm -hmm. and over the year. So I, I think a question that I have is whether we have the right to speak into what that percentage should be based on what your uh, generated, like what your revenue is versus what your budget is. And so I, that's a, maybe a piece of clarification, I think. So for us to sit here and say like, 120% is right or 150% is right, I think it depends on what your, what your expected revenue is based on the programs to fit your costs and expenses. Um, you know what I mean? I do. Outside of uh, me as administrative staff, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say our, um, youth and adult sports uh, staff, we're running city softball leagues we're running city volleyball leagues, we're running city soccer leagues, uh, we run some other stuff with that staff, field coordination, all that stuff. So he's full time, um, but he does do some of the, these special programs. So his time, yes, is already accounted for and budgeted for. Uh, what, what I would wrap into a program is the, if I'm gonna have a facility supervisor, or I'm gonna have a, a coach go out and administer that program, I'm paying for that person because but, but for that program, I wouldn't have that cost. So these are things that we're gonna look for uh, as we try to develop a program and we sit down and do a, a program budget for everything that we do. Um, am I getting yeah, to where you're yeah, going? Yeah, Kay. I get that. I, I would probably, I'd probably, sorry, I should turn that off. Um, I'd probably lean, like that to me seems like that 100%, like fully covering right. the cost. And so just, I would probably agree with Dave on that. Like that seems to me that just, that, that's just built in. Mm -hmm. um, instead of being the 20% or the 50% and figuring out what that number is, I don't know. So I get, you're I saying that like in the 100%, Chris's time be included in that, but say for example, like the adult Sam volleyball, you would above that 100% would be like your reps. Because if you didn't have that program, you wouldn't need to pay those reps. Uh, backwards. Backwards? What I think what the two of these guys are, I what think what the saying. two of these guys are asking here is that uh, you know Phil's time for helping schedule the stuff for the adult so um, volleyball, um, the maintenance of the volleyball court at Pioneer Park, the main, you know putting in a net if the net needs to be replaced. Those are all costs that are kind of factored in to be 100%. Rather than saying we know balls cost this much, we know the refs cost this much, we know you know whatever else physical that we have to pay for costs this much, that's a hundred percent. And the additional 20 or 50% is Phil's time scheduling, putting in sand, cause we're gonna do that anyway. You know, we, he, Phil's gonna be here anyway. The sand's gonna be maintained anyway. The grass around it's gonna be mowed anyway. We know those things are gonna happen regardless if volleyball was there. So Chris is saying that that's, that regardless stuff is the 50% or 20% above the 100. And the costs that are, I know this phone cost me this dollar amount, that's the 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah, Can I explain that better? A little bit, it's the regardless, and it is um, a tool to generate revenue mm -hmm. above and beyond taxpayer subsidy. <coughs> so the general taxpayer in Hastings does not need to support an adult volleyball league unless they're playing in it. And that's what they pay a registration fee for. So that's, we're gonna cover 100% of the direct costs and we're gonna charge them 50% beyond that because they have, um, they, ha they have a very direct benefit of that. So what does that do for organizations like soccer, HYAA? Those are different animals because they are not, um, Park and Rec programs. They are um, their youth associations, and we charge youth associations to use fields for tournaments, and we also charge individuals if they want to rent a field privately. 
So the associations don't pay the he Hastings, city of Hastings. Um, but you heard from Sean, they do rent the arena and they rent facilities and it's, it's not just soccer that does that. And right. we saw it's a fairly substantial sum. So outside athletic fields, we do not charge for the arena we're gonna charge for. What are other communities, how are they set set their program up and to recover costs and I you, mean I'd like to see some you can uh, throw a dart at the board the and, local communities and kind of hit it anywhere <laughs> um, it, it really is all over the board um, and what I've brought here with the suggestions is uh, my past 15 years at management level in parks and recreation departments um, nationwide trends, nationwide discussions, statewide discussions, uh, all focused on this topic. So it's not just my personal feelings, it's my professional education. I guess, I guess I'm looking at it and saying, okay, uh, if Farmington's program that they have for use of their facilities and they outline it and say, okay, here's the 100% of cost, but they figured in everything that we're talking about here, but they call it 100% cost. And then you come over to Hastings and we say it's 120%, you know, and their board sitting there and going, uh, what does that sound like? And I, I'm trying to get to a point where, okay, folks, if our neighboring jurisdictions who we may be competing with some what for some of these activities. If they're uh, saying it's 100% of something and we're saying it's 120% or, or whatever it is, uh, I think that there's a conceptual yep. process here that may be detrimental to our program with that idea. And the language that you'll see will be direct and indirect and full costs. And they will say it's 100% of full cost, so that includes everything um, that's associated with that particular program. Or you'll see 100% of direct costs. That's just the standard language in the Parks and Rec world, and everybody has their own formula. Um, some communities have uh, decided that they are gonna more heavily subsidize than other communities. Um, and then in other areas, you can get into private park and recreation districts and they are fully funded by user fees. And I'll add to that that whatever program we have, we always do kind of a survey around our area to see what those user fees are and see where Hastings fits in that. And most often, we're in the middle or the low end of that on our user fees. So we offer quality product at a reasonable price, and that is kind of the Hastings way. Both HFC and HYAA will, will tell you the same thing with their pricing for stuff. So what we're looking at here are fees strictly for teams, turn, um, you know, it's sand volleyball, whatever, events run by the city of Hastings, not outside like HYAA or HFC. This has nothing to do with associations. This okay. is all city business. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend to prescribe to HYAA what they charge for their programs. No, I'm just saying like <laughs> if, the, the meaning the city's not, look, you're not looking at saying, okay, well, HFC, you have to pay $5 per player to use our fields or HYAA $5 per player for the fields. That's different. Yeah. Diff completely That's different, different. Animal. got it. I would say, I'm, and I'm an expert in means, and I will take your lead on this, Chris, but it seems pretty fair to me what you've got prescribed here. Um, I think it provides good access, like affordability price for the community, and you want to provide benefit to the community too. That's part of what Parks and Rec does. They want to mm -hmm. you know, provide opportunity for people to engage with the community. So I think it's pretty fair. I trust your opinion that you, you know this arena pretty well in terms of the right fee structure and all that too. So is it, will it be a difficulty to identify what's a merit-based program, what's a does that kind of get gray sometimes? Is it pretty easy to kind of slot in those three? For the most part, they're fairly easy to slot. Okay. Um, and we do that from the, the time of inception of that program. What, what's the focus of this? So sure. every, everything that we do, right, is, 
is what's, what's the purpose of, of this program or activity? What, why are we doing it? You know, if we're gonna do something simply to generate revenue, um, we're gonna have to, you know, that has to be a very specialized event. Um, if we're gonna offer something that is just good for the community, then we're gonna, we'll find the spot for that. Sure. And if we have questions, we can bring it here to commission as well, too. Yeah, any, any feedback you guys have um, is appreciated either now at this meeting, if you take this home, read it, have listened to me drone on and on about this and something sparks in your head and you can't go to bed at night, uh, write, it, write it down and let me know what it is. Um, it's, it's still a work in progress, so. I think the, hard, the hardest thing for me would be to make a judgment call based on the suggested numbers. Like if you, you see those numbers and you sit in those numbers, if that 120, 150 is meeting the budget of what is expected in your department, then I, I would see no problem in changing the policy that has best worked for you. Sure. I, I guess that's what I would say. I mean, as long as, as long as the budget numbers are being met, then there's no, I don't see any reason to really fine tune it any more than it is, unless like, unless there's de a development piece that needs to be added into it. Like, hey, we're gonna charge 130% or whatever, and and this is gonna be for future development of these programs or whatever sure. that looks like. Sure. Has there been any feedback from city council on the budget? Uh, as we go through the budget process every year, we'll set uh, revenue and expenses for individual programs. And usually it's based upon what this has been. Yeah. This is kind of what we've been using. We don't have a formal policy for it. And that's where I'm looking to get, right? So that gives us then the, um, the assurity and the continuity from year to year to year. This is, this is how the Parks and Rec Department does it. Um, there's, there will likely be you know, some outliers in it and those are gonna be specific um, activities or it could be specific facilities as well. But. To that point a little bit, I know in the, the larger landscape like college athletics, there's more and more facility fees now that are put in there to, to really go to like the fund to maintain the facility itself. So okay. every concert we have at TCF Bank Stadium, that's wear and tear in there. It's a built-in cost, 10% of whatever the revenue is from that goes towards a basically a, a, a fund that goes to repairing the facility over time. So when that moment comes, when all of a sudden you need to repair something, you're not going back to the city saying, well, here we go now. Right. Well, we've got this built up over time because the utility of this and so on and so forth. So. These are obviously smaller in scale, so I'm not sure quite it would add up that quickly, but, um, but maybe it's already built in with the 20% above that too, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and every year there's, you know, the, um, I'm gonna call it, it's our fund balance. Yeah. So the Parks Maintenance Department Fund 200, there's a, a bank account for that, and we have to carry a certain amount by ordinance in that fund. And then once you get above a certain percentage in that fund, you can then use that to fund other things. Um, so there's always a bank account for emergencies, absolutely. You know, one for the arena, one for the aquatic center, one for parks, uh, you have that. Uh, but uh, yeah, that major maintenance stuff in CIP, and mm -hmm. um, that, that is a different part of the, the budget. Yep. Good. Well, we can move on, like I said, as, as you guys, um, think of other stuff, I'll be working on this. I can't promise I'll work on it within the next three weeks because we're in budget season, but that's fine. <laughs> next piece of business, and um, this is consider park rentals and reservations, or rental reservations, prior to the first working day in January. Uh, we currently won't take a reservation for that year until the first day in January. It's not an official policy, that's our practice. Wanted to have a little discussion about that. I don't know if this commission has any direction. Um, many places, again, do it many different ways. Some are facility specific. I don't want to complicate everything that we do um, too much but I think it's worthy to have a conversation, especially with the recent addition of the Rotary Pavilion um, being used as a wedding venue. Those are hard if you're gonna get married in May to wait until January 
to see if you're the first application in. That's a consideration. Uh, that is not the only use at that facility, but it is one. Uh, does that, do we look at this uh, as all of our, uh, I'm gonna call it park shelters, uh, potentially fields. <coughs> um, I'm gonna keep the arena and the aquatic center kind of out of this. They're doing their own stuff that's working very well. Um, but yeah, just one of the kind of open it up for I think that for a facility like down by the river prior to January would be beneficial especially if someone's playing an event on there but maybe not like the fields and stuff I don't know how that scheduling works but I don't know how that would impact like you know teams and stuff that are used to kind of scheduling with each other yeah so like from a strategic standpoint I think 12 months is the best way to get the most amount of schedules put in there so like lots of campgrounds do it that way yes. like, that's what i was just going to say you know lots of other places that do outdoor type activities do a 12-month lease like the state of minnesota for the campground reservation system um you cannot go any earlier than one year from the date that you want because yeah. mm -hmm. if i wanted to rent the pavilion on january 2nd that means i have to apply get approved and plan everything by the first mm -hmm. that doesn't work I am a huge fan of the in advance because we are planning uh, many of our events, large larger events, uh, in advance, and so it'd be nice to be able to. I like the twelve month lead time mm -hmm. thing as well. The greatest consideration I think for you guys is that that means that the calendar, uh, the block blackout dates or blockout dates, whatever whatever you want to call them, need to be set way ahead of time. So I also understand the complexity that it adds to your calendar um, and how that will affect planning going forward so you have to continuously stay 12 months plus a day ahead of all of the, the scheduling so I understand the complexity of it I would see it as a goal to head towards um, maybe not something to immediately put in place yeah I don't, I don't think this is up for immediate action we're gonna start it tomorrow but yeah Paige and I have certainly discussed uh, the programming efforts that she does and you know how far in advance now she's gonna have to we're gonna have to block out dates for for city sponsored stuff and the other thought process too is there's there's still going to be a priority system i would think whereas if it is a city sponsored thing for the let's say the pavilion then obviously that's something that you should have the priority over we absolutely prioritize ourselves over anybody else no but you can't go canceling yeah. someone's wedding no i know yes yeah. but right. you can't yeah. just leave it out like that but uh we we are not going to bump a private rental for a city sponsored event i think it would help make it more of a destination spot too if it is available to book certain spots of the city up to 12 months in advance because mm -hmm. people can plan accordingly and pick this as a spot when like you said if you're getting married in may you're not going to wait until january to to try to get that space where if you can do it the year before it becomes more of an option yeah. for someone well, and what kind of spaces are we talking about renting out to everything i mean anything it's a hastings park that can be available or yep hastings parks we rent uh rent parks or areas in parks, shelters, uh, the pavilion, amphitheater, those areas. So basically you can call it a picnic shelter, park shelter type of thing at this point. Um, we can consider uh, fields and whatnot as well. I don't know if it's worthwhile to get into that. Uh, I should tell you what happens with that is representatives from all the local associations get together with Phil and they hammered out in probably a what three or four hour session on a giant Microsoft Excel <laughs> spreadsheet and everybody comes together and, and they kind of, the association reps kind of do it themselves um, and we're there uh, to help support if we can. But that's how all of our, our facilities are scheduled for our youth associations and, and adult groups. And I know like for the Hawks, we don't have our league schedule until March. Yeah. It might be better to keep that separate. So that would yep. be really tough yep. for me to book next year yep. <laughs> it'd be impossible so maybe we just focus this down to uh, parks and park shelters and those sorts of things and, and keep the rest of it out of it sure. okay all right so with that what i guess what i'll do and again if there's other ideas that come forward uh you know at 3 a.m when you're trying to go to sleep again <laughs> send those to me and uh we'll look to develop a, a policy to bring back to this body for approval uh, within the next couple of months 
Yes, ma'am. I cannot recite verbatim what our cancellation policy is. I believe with, an, with enough advance notice, there's, there's no prorate. It's a full refund. If you get within 30 days, is it? Yeah, <laughs> of your. Yeah, we've got a, a cancellation policy for our park shelters, um, and weather-related cancellations. We don't we don't do that. Um, we will try to reschedule somebody if if we have a date available that's that's workable for them as well, uh, and just bump them to a different date. We understand, um, but if they come to us the day before and say, "Hey, we're not going to use it," you're not getting any money back. Yeah, because I, I think for me with DJing, it's if you cancel within 90 days, whatever you've deposited, thanks, yep. but no thanks, because you're not getting it back simply because I can't, ha I don't have time to book another show. Yeah. And after 90 days, if we're 90 days or closer to the event, it's you responsible for the full amount just because I really don't have time to book another yep. show. Yep. And I've been holding that date for you for X, you know, number of months. Mm -hmm. So is that some, that same kind of thought process? Yeah, yep. We, and there's a percentage uh, within 90, 60, 30. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's out there and, and we follow that. And very rarely, very rarely actually do we have cancellations. Usually you get less and less back the closer it gets to that yep. date. Yep. Good. All right. Well, within the next couple of months, I'll bring a policy back for you guys to review and go from there. Thank you. Um, Paige, do you have the uh, department updates? Anything? I am. We are currently in full swing down at Levy Park um, with our programming. Last year, we held our summer kickoff event. Um, we had over 320 um, people come out for that um, within Hastings and outside of Hastings uh, visitors. Um, and then we are currently um, hosting two to three events each week down at Levy Park. So we encourage you to come out with your family and friends or volunteer and join us for a fun summer all the way through the end of September. Have we had a meeting since the bike event and how successful the bike event was? Yeah, our uh, first annual Hastings bike tour. We had 50 registrations uh, for this first year uh, with 11 volunteers. Um, and that event uh, went pretty smoothly. We received a lot of feedback uh, through a survey that we sent directly to all of our participants, and we look forward to planning it for 2019 for our second annual Hastings Bike Tour. I'll keep the rest of them very short. The pool is open, go swim, <laughs> and uh, no leaks. No leaks, yeah. And it <laughs> is, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and it's budget season for us. Uh, for all city departments for the next three, four weeks here. Um, we'll be uh, right in the meat of it. So uh, that takes precedence over quite a bit of things. Um, but as always, if you have questions, let us know. At 3 a.m. is just fine. I'll get back to you at about 8. <laughs> we start emailing you at 3. That's fine. <laughs> Good. Anything else we need covered? I think that'll do. Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion from the commission? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Meeting is adjourned.